It's Heather. Before we get started, I just wanted to quickly jump in with your quick, friendly neighborhood reminder that you are invited to join Tuesday Group. If you've been thinking about joining, or if you've been thinking about coming back for another meeting, I'd really love to have you. Group is a supportive place where you can all come together to talk about the challenges that come with having a narcissistic or emotionally limited mom. We meet every Tuesday at noon Pacific Standard Time, and it's just $35 a session. Drop in whenever you need some extra support, no pressure, just a community that gets it. And don't forget that the link to join is in the show notes. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Today on Mother Mayhem. Your trauma brain now is in overdrive. It's afraid to leave, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn because it has lost trust that you know when the threat is over. Welcome back to Mother Mayhem, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Podcast for Daughters. I'm your host, Heather Gray. And ladies, if we know anything by now, it is that the narcissist is always going to narcissist. We know this. We know that this is who they are. We know that this is what they do. And we know this is why they do what they do. And if we know, all of this. Why can't we just move on? Why do we still obsess over everything that's happened and think about everything in excruciating detail over and over and over again? Well, because it just isn't that easy. The only way is through, but sometimes in going through it, you get stuck and you need some help shifting things to find a way out. I think that's what's happening for today's daughter, and I think we can get her out. Today's daughter, I am naming Candace, because it's a name that represents someone who's straightforward, candid, and honest. And in reflecting on Candace's story, that's exactly how I found her to be. She did her very, very best, and still she found herself landing in a whole pile of hurt, betrayal, and trauma. Here's Candace, and I will find you on the other side. There. What do you do when intellectually you know what the deal is, but the deal causes so much pain you just can't see past it? I keep thinking that because I understand everything and because I know who my mom is and what she is, that I should just be over all of this and move on. Actually, I don't even need to move on. I just need to feel like I want to be able to grieve that this is who my mom is, be sad, and move forward. I am obsessing and I'm ruminating on everything, on every word, on every action, and on every single part of this. What has happened to me and my family is all I'm thinking about. I'm mad, sad, angry, all the things, all the feelings. I feel like I get everything you tell us about wise mind, and I feel like my wise mind knows I did everything I could, that there was nothing I could have done differently, and I know for sure I did not deserve what happened. I know it wasn't my fault. What else, Heather, do I need to know? Can you help me understand what I'm missing? Because I'm not sleeping well. My eating is out of control. My husband has had to be a nonstop comfort. Even my kids are comforting me. And that is decimating me because that isn't their job. I don't want to lose any more days to my mother. She doesn't deserve them. It's the last precious few days of summer with my kids. And before I know it, I become taxi cab mom and I start carting everyone all around from school to practice and whatnot. So here's what happened. I think my biggest question for you is, why am I obsessing when I know everything there is to know about the situation? Why am I focused on what she said and what she did and how she did it and how she said it? I am so sick of myself, just sick of myself. Why am I so obsessed with knowing why, especially when I know why? She's a narcissist. That's why. 
My mom turned 65, and as typical of her, she threw her own birthday party. My brother and I had offered to do this for her and even suggested we combine it as a retirement party because her birthday and retirement would both be this summer. Mom declined and said she'd host it herself. She decided to hold a wine tasting at her home and was going to do a catered dinner so she didn't have to cook and scheduled it for 6.30 one evening. We have three kids ages 5, 10, and 12. When I heard about my mom's plans, I instantly became anxious because nothing about that plan implies that this is kid-friendly, not the timing, not the alcohol. I called her and I asked her if she just wanted to have my husband and I come and then do something with my kids separate. She was insulted at the inference that I wasn't going to have my kids see her for her birthday and didn't seem to understand my worries. She said birthdays are for getting everything you want, and she wanted my kids there, and she wanted to be able to have good food and good wine with grown-ups because she wasn't the one with little kids. My husband and I checked in about it, and we made a plan. I called my mom ahead of time, and I let her know that we would be there, but we would be leaving early for the kids. She tried to argue, and I asked her if she would prefer us not to come than leave early, and she said to come. Heather, we thought we were winning. We brought special sparkling grape juice for the kids. We even got white and Concord grape. When the adults had white wine, the kids had white sparkling grape juice. When the adults switched to red, my kids switched to Concord grape sparkling juice. They were so happy, and I thought we had had it nailed. The kids, well, they were just tickled. The adults were tickled and charmed. My mom beamed and toasted them. It just worked. I let my mom know about a half an hour before we were to leave that we'd be going soon, and she literally just waved me off. When we were set to leave, the kids gave her hugs, and Heather, I shit you not, my mom went from fine to wailing and crying and not understanding why we had to leave her party, why she couldn't just be with her grandkids for her birthday, and why I couldn't be flexible just this once. She made a scene and said that I only love her at times that are convenient for me, and that I am teaching my kids to do the same. Wine mixed with narcissism was an awful look on her. (laughs) Yeah, sounds awful, but that was funny. Then my brother, with his arm around his own wife, just looked and said, Really? You can't stay? You're going to let this ruin mom's birthday? That was it for my husband. He corralled the kids, waved and left, and I just cried. And I said I was sorry to have disappointed everyone and to have caused tension in an otherwise beautiful evening. What happened next was just awful. My brother called the next day berating me and accusing me of having the plan all along to really stick it to mom publicly. Her best friend called to tell me that it took hours to settle my mom after her heart had just been broken wide open. I got texts, I got Facebook messages from people who weren't even there accusing me of turning my kids against my mom. The smear campaign was on. My mom apparently regaled the party attendees with all the ways I have failed her my entire life. She just didn't imagine I would ever do it so publicly, but she was glad to see that everyone got to see what an ingrate I was. That last comment, Heather, I was just done. I felt a chill go down my spine, and I knew I was done. My aunt lives out of town. She called me to tell me that the family really wanted me to apologize, and she said she was really disappointed in me, that I was unrecognizable to her. Unrecognizable, Heather. Unfucking recognizable. I am not making any such apology. I have not talked to my brother. I have not talked to any family members. I have deleted and blocked anyone who cared to entertain any of my mother's histrionics. My two oldest girls both have August birthdays, and my mother sent them something. The kids saw how mean my mom was to me and how she made me cry, 
and said we could just throw them away unopened because anyone that was mean to me wasn't their friend. (laughs) Oh, I love your girls. I love your girls so much. So we did that, and we never acknowledged the gifts with my mother. So it's just me, my husband, and my kids, and my husband's family. No one on my mom's side of the family is talking to me, and I don't much want to talk to them, so it's fine. My mom hasn't reached out, and I haven't either, and I'm hoping that this is just how no contact happens. So many of your words have been swirling in my head. I feel like I know what you're going to say, but I am asking anyway. Can you help? Oh my goodness, Candace, I certainly hope I can help. Here we go. You probably do know what I'm going to say, but please just give me a second to say it anyway. Sit back. Close your eyes and just allow yourself to hear the support that I would like to offer. This sucks. It's mean and it's awful. And you tried your best and your best didn't work. You get to be heartbroken over that. You get to feel discouraged and you get to feel defeated. And you do, of course, have to grieve and process all of this. We have had a lot of conversations about grieving the mother you never had and always deserved on this show. We talked just a few weeks ago to Frankie about her anger and her hurt. And you know that is the going through it part. You know the grief part. Yes, sister, you're right. You know all of this. You know all of the things I have already said about this, but I hear you are looking for the things that maybe I haven't said, or at least I haven't said all that recently. So here goes. You are giving a lot of the attention to the really important part of your story, who your mother is, what she did, and the fact that she did it because she's a narcissist. Those are the parts of your story and you've got them down. What about the other parts of the story, Candace? I think there are other parts of this story that are begging for your attention, for some validation, and for some healing. You want to know the part that took my breath away, Candace? When you said, we were winning, we had it nailed, and then suddenly, Candace, even with all your communication and forethought, your mom still self-combusted. But this time, your guard had been down. Your guard was down, Candace, and she got you. She got to you publicly, in public view. She gaslit you, shamed you, ridiculed you, and set you on fire. And then she let the crowd watch. God damn it, Candace. That makes me so mad for you. So mad. What an awful, awful thing to have to experience. What an awful, sad, cruel thing. This won't surprise you, but my eyes are welling up thinking about what this must have felt like for you to think you had finally figured out a way to make her happy, to give her what she needed. Maybe you had even dared to think that you might have exceeded her expectations because giving your kids their own wine tasting was so special and so genius, and it had made a wine tasting with kids less awkward for all the other guests. They got to be charmed and see what a great grandmother your mom is, and your kids love her, and all of that got to be on display too. What a goddamn sucker punch. It's awful, Candace. And of course, this still hurts because you knew all the things. You had all of the pieces. You made all of the plans. And still, you ended up getting torched and marked as public enemy number one. I hate this so much for you because your guard was down. Your defenses were down. You were essentially unprotected, and you got walloped. That is crushing, and of course, of course it puts you in chronic dysregulation. 
Of course, your trauma brain now is in overdrive. It's afraid to leave, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn because it has lost trust that you know when the threat is over. Your hypervigilance and ruminating make a lot of sense to me given how this went down. So much sense to me, and I want to walk you through it. But first, I need you to just sit with me for a bit longer because I'm afraid we still have to zoom that lens out just a bit wider. And this one, I'm afraid, Candace, is also going to hurt. So just take a deep breath and lean into the reminder that the only way is through. And you can't get through this until you see all of the pieces you need to see. Okay, here goes. Deep breath. Your mom, what she did and what happened, well, she isn't the only thing that happened to you on that day or on the days after. She was the devil you knew, and she acted like the devil you knew, so that's the part you get. The part that has you rattled to your core and unable to move might not be your mom. She was the predictable one on this. What is shaking you, I imagine, is that your mom acted bat shit crazy. Bat shit crazy. And everyone there drank the fucking Kool-Aid, Candace, without even looking at it, without questioning it, or taking a second to realistically look at the situation. It must feel like you, your husband, and your kids were at a different party. Your brother turned on you. The party guests who had been charmed by your kids turned on you. Your aunt, the rest of your family, people in your phone, on Facebook. Your mom, we already knew, was living in crazy town. You didn't know that everyone else, likely people you loved and respected, lived there too. That they would see her crazy and still take her side. Oh my God. God, Candace, of course you're rattled. Of course you are. Replaying every little thing in your head on repeat, trying to figure out where and how it went so entirely off the rails. Of course you are. I would be too. Your mom traumatized you. We know this. She attacked you. She publicly shamed you, embarrassed you, angered your husband, and probably even scared your kids a little bit. But even with all of this, she was your mother. She did what she does and what she created is sort of as much as I hate saying it here. That part, well, that's the familiar trauma. She was the devil you knew and she acted like it. You were probably used to managing the aftermath of situations like this that she's created before. This, though, was a completely different beast. In one fell swoop, you lost a lot more people. A part of you may have always been prepared to lose your mom, and you may have even been mentally preparing for such a thing as this in the back of your mind. That may have been a long time coming, and maybe you were just biding your time. But losing your brother, your aunt, other family members and friends? What the actual? You never imagined this would happen that this would be how your story went, so now you're rattled to your core and stuck in this dysregulating pattern. Now you probably feel crazy because you can't make sense of yourself to yourself. You're telling yourself that you saw your mom coming from a mile away, that you know who she is and you know what she does. You just didn't count on all of the rest. And it is all of the rest, Candace, that's rattling you. It's making you feel unsafe and it has you questioning everything. It's also piling on the grief because now you didn't just lose your mom. You lost everyone attached to her that you liked, loved, or respected. So here we go, Candace. A deep breath again. This is the part you have to feel. You have to grieve this part too. 
And all of this means that you were now forced to build a new normal for yourself and your family, and you weren't expecting to have to do that when you so excitedly bought two different kinds of sparkling grape juice. In a concrete way here, I want to remind you that you don't have to think about it all day, every day. Right now, it's feeling out of your control, and I think I'm going to be able to help with that. But first, before I say anything, I want you to feel like you have more of a handle on your days and on your moods. And this is going to sound a little bit wackadoo, but we are going to schedule your grief into your day. Right now, it is leaking and it is oozing everywhere because you're pushing through, just trying to get back to summer as fast as possible. And you are learning that grief work doesn't work like that. Now, we know it's going to seep into your thoughts from time to time, but also schedule it in. Set aside time each day, a half an hour or so, where you can have grief time. You can journal, you can go for a walk, do some self-care, think about things, call a friend. I am going to be giving you things to think about as we chat here, and you can use that time for that also. But mostly, we want your grief, because it's yours, to feel more in control of it, so we have to get you to schedule it in. Then, if it's 7 o'clock at night and you are putting your kids to bed and thoughts creep in, You can say, not now. Yes, that's sad and scary, and I am making time for that. I'll make time for this thought in my next grief slot. Then you aren't telling yourself not to think about it at all, not to feel it. You are just saying, not now, later. And you are naming the time. So in your body, you know your thoughts and feelings will be seen and validated and they will get their turn at such and such time. But right now, you want to be present with your kids and family. That will help you validate your experience, put a little bit of a container around it, while still making sure that your life becomes a little more your own with each passing day. Okay, what we're dealing with here, Candice, is betrayal trauma. Because of your mom, you're not just dealing with the original hurt she caused. You're dealing with the loss of support, loyalty, and trust from those I imagine you had anticipated would stand by you. You expected people to stand by you, Candace, and of course you did. And the fact that they didn't is a betrayal. When you're dealing with a narcissistic parent, you brace yourself for certain kinds of hurt. They become anticipated in a way. But when their behavior escalates into a smear campaign, it feels like that gut punch you experienced, one you didn't expect or see coming. It's as if the ground you thought was solid had suddenly shifted beneath your feet. When family members and friends fall for that distorted reality that your mom created, it'll feel as though you're being pushed into this like isolating void. The support system you relied on suddenly seems to disappear, and it makes you feel like you were left to face this all alone. And it's really common to find yourself in that spiral, replaying the events and trying to make sense of the chaos. And as you're experiencing, Candace, That constant rumination can keep you stuck in that loop of pain and confusion, and it's really hard to find the path forward. Candace, you have to allow yourself to feel the hurt, betrayal, and loss, and any other feelings that might be coming up for you. These emotions, well, they're valid, and they're a part of your healing process, and I think you might be lumping them in with your mom and all that she did, and then wondering why you don't feel better. And I think it's because this betrayal trauma, well, that's the part that isn't getting addressed. So it's screaming at you to pay attention to it. You can't push those feelings aside. Instead, you need to give yourself some space to experience them fully 
but you still want to be in control of them. And I know that because part of what's so hard for you right now is that you are feeling entirely out of control of this entire thing right now. So here's what we're going to do. A concrete way to do this is to pull out a piece of paper. Okay, all of you listening, <laughs> I'm talking to Candace, and I'm also talking to all of you. Back in the day, I got to do these episode companion guides, and I got to have you take notes and journals and go to a link where I had this all done. I just don't have the bandwidth for that right now. So if y'all are journalers, if you're note takers, now is the time to pause the podcast, find the notebook, the pen, pull out your phone, because I want to walk you through how to do this. So Candace, what I want you to do is pull out that piece of paper. And I want you to write down a list of all of the things that happened in the event and in the aftermath. Each person who said something, each person who did something, each person you had to block or cut off as a result of their words and choices, list them out. And next to each thing, I want you to acknowledge how it felt when they did those things. And I want you also to write down what it made you think. Then take a moment to imagine what you would have imagined might have happened before everyone made these choices. In imagining an event like this, you likely would have imagined more support from your brother. You might imagine that your aunt would have asked more questions before jumping to conclusions. You might have imagined any of these things to just know who your mother is and how she moves through the world, and you might have anticipated being believed or given the benefit of the doubt in the event that anything like this would have occurred. If you can look at what happened, what you felt, what it made you think, you will be able to see for yourself all that you've been through. And I think that will help you calm down as you start to make more sense to yourself. However, trauma brain, well, it's on high alert right now. Part of your dysregulation and hypervigilance is because all of this wildly unexpected shit happened and your trauma brain can't tell whether or not the threat is over, if there will be more, and if things are safe yet. So we have to work on assuring you of renewed safety. It sounds like you already have some people blocked. That is a clear, decisive way of getting yourself safe. Is there anyone on that list that isn't blocked, but maybe should be? What do you need right now to feel safe? Are there boundaries you need to set or anything you need to reassure yourself of? And are there any open loops that need closing? There might be bridges that you told yourself you'd cross when you got to them. Maybe instead of waiting to get to them, you have to get to them and deal with them so your trauma brain can stop waiting for shoots to drop. Where are you feeling unsafe or exposed? Some of it is just because your feelings are raw. And if you think there's an opening where more trauma could occur or where you're vulnerable to being hurt more, I would tend to that and I would get support in tending to that so you can be and feel safe. And it's important to remember that you don't have to do it alone, but you deserve to feel safe in order to help you regulate. We need to get you feeling safe. Now, Candace, I also have to ask. Is there anything you need to say to these people? Often in these situations, you're going to hear me remind all of you that saying anything is just for you. Not to change anyone's mind, not to expect an apology or a change in anyone's behavior, not to get anyone to agree with you, but sometimes not saying something stops working for you. It starts to feel like you just rolled over. It feels like turning a cheek. You don't feel like turning. While you still have that notebook open, maybe think of people you have been affected by 
and jot down anything you might need to say to them. Just writing it down might help you feel better, and you might decide that you don't actually have to open any doors and say anything to them. Or you might decide that part of what's holding you hostage here is not saying something, so you might opt to do that. Either way, I would encourage you to walk through this as an option so you can consciously choose to do it or consciously choose not to do it. I read your letter and it sounds like you know the steps. Close the door. Don't beg people to fight for you. Accept their choices and move on. But if you didn't consciously and intentionally walk yourself through all of that, you might end up feeling like you don't have ownership over the choice. So get that sense of ownership back with this kind of intentional decision making. Now, Candace, your kids rallied for you. They chose you and you need to let them. I understand the fear you have about your kids taking care of you or comforting you. That feels a little bit too close to what your moms make your daughters do, but this isn't that. Your kids are a member of your family, and when one of you hurts, you all hurt. Your husband, he's had your back. Your kids have had your back. Let them. Soak it in. Who else just automatically, unequivocally believed you? Who else have you shared this with? Because I do hope you've shared it with your people. I know in situations like this, you daughters sometimes get scared that you won't be believed, that you don't tell the story, but that just further isolates you. So anyone who you consider your people, tell them. Because if they don't have you and they don't hold you, you might as well know that now while you're still taking out the trash, so to speak. Because then, sister, you start rebuilding your circle. You repair the broken links. You pay attention to the family you choose. You mourn the loss of who isn't in your life. For sure you do that. Of course you do. Healing doesn't ever happen if you skip that part. This will have changed you. And while I can forget sometimes to encourage you all to journal, this would be a really good time to start journaling. It'll help you feel like you have a container to put all of this into. You'll first want to remind yourself of who you are and what you know to be true about yourself. Right now, I know you're feeling fragile, but you're not always going to feel this way. At some point, you will see the choices you've made, how you've carried yourself, and you will be grateful to yourself for showing up for yourself. And I would encourage you to tune into that. I would thank yourself for showing up for yourself in this way, for being brave enough to feel it, to really go through it, and to do the work. This, it isn't easy, and you're facing it. You haven't run away from it, and you aren't trying to skip steps. Let the dust settle. Return to your body. Get to feeling calm again. Get to feeling like not every day rises and sets on this. And then get to knowing yourself again, to knowing who you are, how you move through the world, what you think, what you feel, what you believe now, who your people are. Reintroduce yourself to yourself and then bring that new energy outward. Let it shine. Let your new people find you. And new people, for sure, are going to find you. And then, Candace, you have to have some fun, sister. <laughs> you want time with your kids? Schedule it in. Make a super fun family day. Whatever feels like fun for you, but something that gets you out of your regular every day. Something you can look forward to. Something that lights you up and will become a memory-making kind of day with your kids. Maybe do the same thing with your husband or you and your girlfriends. Put fun on the calendar. Put you on the calendar. Give yourself something to look forward to. And then, Candace, 
I say this with every good intention in my body. Honestly, sometimes you just have to say, fuck the rest of them. Honestly, go live your life. Let the people who love you, love you. Find your peace, find yourself, and give yourself permission to live again. Now, before I wrap up and I send you all on your way, just a last quick reminder here that if today's episode resonated with you and you're looking for more support, you're always welcome to join Tuesday Group. You are going to find that link in the show notes. You are all in a community of women around the world who are in this together. And I, for sure, am in it with you too. Bye for now. I do hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you have a question you'd like me to consider for the show, please do email me over at heather at daughtersnpd.com. You are always welcome to share your story or questions by recording yourself using the voice app on your phone. For best recording quality, please do record directly into your phone without using headphones or Bluetooth speakers. We're building an incredible community as well over on Instagram, and I'd love to see you over there too. You can find us at Daughters NPD. Lastly, if you love what you've been hearing here on Mayhem and have found the show helpful in your own trauma recovery, please do consider becoming a Mother Mayhem sponsor by purchasing simple scripts for saying hard things. It's a resource I created that provides the right words for the hard conversations and it covers life, love, and work. You'll find a link for that in the show notes. If you know another woman who needs this conversation in her life, please do share the show with her. Your reviews and social shares help spread the word, and I hope you'll consider doing so. Special thanks to Heather Clark for editing the show. She's in my head and knows what I meant to say when the words come out backwards. Thanks so much for your time today. As always, I'm in it with you. Bye for now.